appeared before the Congressional Committee to tell what I knew of activities which might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it. And he took the step without approval from either the U.S. Congress or the people of the United States. The secret organizations of the world power elite are no longer secret. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? I'm Jim Tucker. I've chased Bilderberg for 30 years. I'll never give up the chase. Bilderberg plan for the whole world is nothing less than world government. I'm not comfortable with that at all. Who elected these guys to run the planet? They are the elitist. They feel they should run the world for their own selfish interests. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. Bilderberg is making great progress toward a world government, and only an educated, informed public can stop them in their tracks. David Rockefeller admits in his own memoirs that he wants to destroy the United States. Right. He's a traitor. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. I need you to move off the property, please. Some shots were fired. There's Bilderbergers right there. The Trans-Texas Corridor is a vital part because we stop it here in Texas. We stop the new world order right here in Texas. This thing started here. And to save this country, we kill this damn thing here. chance for the President of the United States to carry out a phrase his father used, and that is a new world order. Your new world order will fall. Yeah. Humanity will defeat you. The answer to 1984 is 1776. In the near future, Earth is dominated by a powerful world government. Once free nations are slaves to the will of a tiny elite, the dawn of a new dark age is upon mankind. Countries are a thing of the past. Every form of independence is under attack, with the family and even the individual itself nearing extinction. Close to 80% of the Earth's population has been eliminated. The remnants of a once free humanity are forced to live within highly controlled, compact, prison-like cities. Travel is highly restricted. Superhighways connect the megacities and keep the population from entering into unauthorized zones. No human activity is private. AI supercomputers chronicle and categorize every action. A prison planet dominated by a ruthless gang of control freaks whose power can never be challenged. This is the vision of the global elite, their goal. A program of total dehumanization where the science of tyranny is law. A worldwide control grid designed to ensure the overlord's monopoly of power forever. 
Our species will be condemned to this nightmare future unless the masses are awakened to the New World Order master plan and mobilized to defeat it. Erected by a secretive group, the Georgia Guidestones are a testament to the elite's plan for a world religion, global laws, with a global court and army to enforce it. And set in stone, it is written that the population never rise above 500 million. In this film, you will learn how our world is truly governed. You will see how highly secretive roundtable groups interlock to form a global intelligence network. This group has been steering planetary affairs for hundreds of years. Now in the final stage, they prepare for open world government. A goal tyrants throughout history have lusted after. Dr. Michael Kaufman is a published ecologist specializing in ecosystem research. Forest ecology and ecosystem classification. Dr. Kaufman played a key role in blocking the ratification of the Convention on Biological Diversity in the U.S. Senate. The concept of a new world order has been around for centuries. It's been re receiving tremendous play over the last half of the 20th century. Uh, George Bush, the first senior president, George Bush, used it a lot in his speeches and really implies that he really wants to see a order in which we have a universal or a global type of governance in which every human being on planet Earth is ultimately responsible to policies that are being formulated at the international level. It is a big idea, a new world order. President Bush uh, said that the new world order was uh, in, 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 in tune and that's what they were working for. The UN is part of that government. They're working right now very significantly for a North American Union. That's why there's a lot of people in Washington that don't care too much about our borders. They have a philosophic belief that national sovereignty is not important. It's also the reason I have made very strong suggestion that we need not be in the United Nations for our national security. It's really always the same. You go back throughout of all of history, the Roman Empire, the Soviet Union, Hitler during the Nazism was always saying that it's going to create the utopia for the average person when in fact history always shows that it does exactly the opposite. Conquest and empire is as old as civilization. Babylon, Egypt and Greece. They all built empires in an attempt to rule the world. The Roman system at its peak dominated the known world. Complex governmental systems were developed to control diverse populations. During the period between the 15th and 19th century, new empires emerged and again waged war for supremacy. The nobility as well as the thriving merchant class were financed by a handful of private banks. Many of the great money houses would hedge their bets and finance both sides of a war. Sophisticated intelligence gathering networks gave the financiers a clear edge over the governments they were slowly gaining control of. On the 18th of June, 1815, agents of the British arm of the Rothschild family looked on as Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte fought desperately to save his army from the jaws of a British-Prussian pincer attack. A Rothschild agent was able to get the news of Napoleon's defeat at the hands of Lord Wellington to Nathan Rothschild a full 20 hours before the news reached London. Nathan, the head of the British arm of the Rothschild family, put out the rumor to the London Stock Exchange that Napoleon had won the war. Stocks plunged by 98% and Rothschild was then able to buy up the entire British economy for pennies on the pound. When the news of Napoleon's defeat finally arrived, stocks soared. Britain was now the undisputed ruler of Europe, and Rothschild ruled England. The already dominant British Empire grew even more aggressive. Her troops and bureaucracy spread across the globe. 
the sun never set on Britannia's holdings. The banking cartel funded, in fact, since about 1800, they have funded both sides of almost every war. And of course, they're getting the interest off of the loans that they've given the various governments and the wars that they have actually helped stimulate and create. By 1900, Germany was a rising force and a leader of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, World War I, for instance, there was absolutely no reason to have World War I, except that it was an ideal opportunity for the banking cartel to make a pile of money by funding both sides of that particular war. On June 28, 1914, the heir to the Austrian-Hungrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated while traveling in a motorcade. The Black Hand, a Serbian secret society with connections to French and British intelligence, took credit. World War I had begun. Armaments companies financed by Rothschild-controlled banks in Germany, France, England, and Austria bankrolled all the factions. At least 20 million were killed in the war. It was a conflict so terrible the people vowed to never fight again. They dubbed it the war to end all wars. The question is, why did they want war? Well, first of all, is money and power. But secondly, they wanted to create the League of Nations. They had this in their plans all along, and as a consequence, once the war was over or about to be over, they began to formulate this idea of a League of Nations so this would never, ever happen again. Hundreds of years of practice made the British experts at hiding their empire behind puppet governments and councils. In the name of stopping all future conflicts, they proposed that countries would join a League of Nations. Their true intention was for the League to serve as a framework for world government. President Woodrow Wilson, who had spearheaded the establishment of the private Federal Reserve System in the United States in 1913, strongly supported the establishment of the League of Nations. Woodrow Wilson was a very naive president. He was basically a college professor that was grafted into this whole system. The League convened in Paris in 1919, but many nations recognized it as a threat to their sovereignty and refused to join. Frustrated by the U.S. Congress blocking the League of Nations, British intelligence, with the help of the Rockefeller family, set up the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City in 1921. The Council recruited the best and brightest of American life to support the growth of the Anglo-American Empire. The CFR's stated mission is to abolish all nation-states in favor of an all-powerful world government administered by a tiny elite. By 1930, the promoters of world government had split into two interlocking camps. The Fabian Socialists centered in London and the Fascist based in Italy and Germany. National Socialism will use its own revolution for establishing a new world order. Adolf Hitler. Supporters of the fascists in the United States and England believed that the military should be used to quickly transform the world into a new world order. All the more sophisticated practitioners of globalism stated that incrementalism was the sure path to world domination. Congressional Medal of Honor winner Major General Smedley Butler went public in 1934, exposing an attempt by the robber barons to launch a military overthrow of the United States. The war hero testified to the McCormick Dickstein Committee in Congress that some of the most powerful men in America had tried to recruit him to lead a military coup so they could set up national socialism in the United States. appeared before the Congressional Committee 
the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. The fascist had also made deep inroads in England. Edward VIII, King of England, was forced to abdicate the throne because of his public support for Hitler. Though the German-led fascist camp was strong, the Fabian Socialist bloc was able to maintain control of the U.S., Russia, and England. In the build-up to World War II and during the conflict, the bankers again financed both sides, just as they had done with Napoleon. rise and fall the Third Reich, Europe lay in ruins. Once again, the elite claimed that only global governance could save humanity from certain destruction. And this time, the elite would succeed in setting up their world body. In April of 1945, at the Presidio Naval Base in San Francisco, the United Nations was founded by the victors of World War II. The United Nations complex was then built in New York City on land donated by John D. Rockefeller. Shortly after the elite established the United Nations as their base in the United States, the newly formed World Council quickly began work on the next phase in their plan, the incremental formation of continental superstates. The first step in their trilateral plan was the creation of the European Union. Unifying Europe had been tried many times and was extremely unpopular. Where Napoleon and Hitler had failed to accomplish their goals using force, the globalists would succeed using stealth. The British spearheaded the formation of the Council of Europe on May 5, 1949. The Treaty of London claimed to only establish trade ties between European nations, like NAFTA or GATT in North America. Its true intention was the formation of a European superstate. In 1954, the elite of the planet met in secret at the Bilderberg Hotel in Oosterbeck, Holland. The Bilderberg Group would later admit that their mission was the formation of the EU. Once the EU was established, under the guise of trade deals, a North American Union and Asian Union would be formed. The three interlocking superstates form the core of the global government while the United Nations would serve as a world regulatory and enforcement body over the Third World subregions. The Bilderberg Group consists of the heads of all of the managing roundtable groups that steer individual countries. Picture the elite power structure of the world as a giant pyramid, with only the elite of the elite at the tip top of the capstone. The group has been so secretive that until the mid-1980s, the controlled corporate media denied its existence. Into the late 1990s, coverage only consisted of rare one-line mentions.
With the rise of the alternative media, their stranglehold on information has begun to slip. On the outskirts of the national capital today, black limousines with darkened windows converged on a hotel where private security guards imposed ironclad control. The limos carried royalty, political power brokers, and industrial titans to a secret meeting that will last all weekend. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? Every four years, Bilderberg meets in North America. And in June of 2006, we decided to travel to Ottawa, the capital of Canada. The site of Bilderberg. In Bilderberg's long history, many reporters attempting to cover the group have been harassed, detained, and even jailed. I jokingly reassured my cameramen that the horror stories we'd read about were probably exaggerated. I was wrong. We know reporters get detained at airports. People aren't let in. We know people get uh, uh, you know, sent to the jailhouse for three or four hours. It happens every time. Well, it happened to Alex Jones this time. They admitted Bilderberg that they've had pressure put on them by the government uh, to heighten security and that that's why all this happened. Yes, I was told that by two separate people. They scoured our records for hours yesterday and hours today trying to find something on us and of course there was nothing. It was just scary. I mean, I've, again, I've been all over the world and I've never seen anything like this. It was like hours of humiliation. And they said, what are you here for? And I said, well, I'm here to, you know, cover the media, covering a political event, I hope to talk to some members of parliament. I was answering all the questions, it was clear I wasn't a threat, it was clear I didn't have any criminal record, it was clear I was press, it was clear I was coming to interview people. They were going to deny me, they told me earlier that, 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 that I was probably going to be denied, and then you guys showed up and everything changed. So what's your plan now? My plan is to go out and try to interview Jim Tucker, to try to go down to the Bilderberg group and maybe catch some of them still arriving, and try to still make a documentary. Instead of being here at 8 a.m. in the morning when the Bilderberg group attendees, the 100 elite of the planet, start showing up, we're going to be getting here about 3.30 or so, and we'll see if we can catch any of the elites uh, coming in. agenda for this uh, this edition of the Bilderberg Society of Zonia Meeting? They're debating the attack on Iran. They're talking about how to take out Hugo Chavez. They're talking about how to get their American Union in that destroys Canadian, U.S., and Mexican sovereignty. So we're talking about the death of Canada is what's happening in there right now. The death of your sovereignty is happening in there right now. CNN has even reported that these individuals have put out the policy reports through the Council on Foreign Relations that writes their scholarly white papers to end the United States, to end Canada, and to end Mexico. About 10 have come in. They've been coming in slowly uh, in typically big black cars with what appears to be bulletproof glass, and we've got a few pictures of some of the people. Uh, we're being kept well back from the building by an awful lot of uh, security people. But, you know, there'll be more security as this thing develops. Again, just a reminder, stay off the front, okay? I am, I am. Th you. This is the line. We check with the city. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. First <laughs> I came here from uh, upstate New York. I booked a room way in advance. When I checked in at 10 o'clock at night, they told me I had to be out at 8.30 in the morning. And so, of course, I complied to what they wanted. I wasn't happy about it because I had been tired. I drove quite a long way. Then I uh, went down to uh, have something to eat. And I just saw a bunch of security here. And I was wondering what was going on. And I asked questions. And uh, they said they were having a wedding or they were having some sort of reception. So I decided uh, to ask a couple more questions because I thought it was kind of weird. 
And then I saw them uh, from my hotel window. They were in the back with flashlights looking at the trees, looking up the, through the trees. And they were also in front of the hotel uh, combing. It looked like combing the hotel. So I kind of got was wondering what was going on. And I left. Uh, I got up this morning. Uh, I checked out. And then the, the fellow that I spoke with, the last fellow I spoke with, said, well, you'll know all about it in, in the newspaper. Well, I didn't have to wait because there was a group of people out here telling me everything that was going on. They're not fooling anybody any, any longer when you've got this many cops, you know, and detaining Alex Jones at the border. Get them on both sides. Yeah, you crook. Yeah, you're gonna go to jail like Ken Lay. Oh yeah, there's one right there. Hi. Hey, we're not your property. We're not your slaves. We're gonna defeat the New World Order. The New World Order is gonna be defeated. You realize that? I'm glad you do. Always does throughout history. Etienne Davignon is the honorary chairman of the Bilderberg Group, as well as the head of its steering committee. The committee he heads selects and invites each year's attendees. In the last decade, the list of attendees has been leaked to reporters by moles on the inside. Veteran newspaper reporter Jim Tucker has been covering the Bilderberg meetings for over 30 years and has physically attended more than 20. We traveled back to our hotel to see if Jim Tucker received the 2006 list. First heard about Bilderberg in 1975, and I said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. Who in, hell, who in hell's Bilderberg? I spent 20 happy years with metropolitan newspapers. All the wires are clicking at my ear. That could not happen without me knowing about it. And the thing that first impressed me most was calls in 1957 by the late, great Westbrook Pegler, widely syndicated columnist. He wrote two lengthy columns about how approximately 100 leaders of international finance, heads of state, high public officials were meeting behind armed guards and closed doors on Jekyll Island, sealed off. What are these powerful internationalists doing? And why is it so secret? Why do they have armed guards outside? Why is it sealed off? The newspapers totally ignore it. Not a word. Total blackout in the United States. Since then, I've never stopped pursuing Bilderberg or the whole international gangster organization led by Rockefellers and Rothschilds as they manipulate the world for their own selfish interest. Jim, you've been waiting on the list. You normally get it on the first day. You haven't gotten it. We're told it might come in today. How important is that list? It's absolutely essential, although identifying people outside as we always do is important too, to find out who is not on their own list. In recent years, Someone from Europe has uh, sent the, a machine copy with a letterhead and so forth without identifying himself. So far, I haven't heard from him. Well, Bilderberg assumed that name in 1954 at their first meeting as Bilderberg at the Bilderberg Hotel. It's a little bit like Shakespeare's As You Like It. They say to Shakespeare, what do you want to call this book? And he says, As You Like It, meaning whatever you want to call it. And they thought it was dictation, so one of the, uh, his plays is called As You Like It, and the title has nothing to do with the play. So that's how the Bilderberg came by their name. Now, they had been meeting for half a century, the moneyed class had been meeting. 
but they decide they have to meet systematically every year, uh, well planned in advance, in, uh, in addition to maybe uh, other smaller meetings throughout the year. Sure this is the right turn, Jim? No. Let's see if you can start. This is the global government. They are setting the world agenda. Inside right now, they're deciding on whether or not there will be a war with Iran. They're deciding whether or not taxes will increase, whether oil prices will be suppressed or increased. There are, uh, there's much more on the agenda that we'll be finding out in the fullness of time. But those are three items that are heavy on their list this year. This is Jim Tucker, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Yes. 27 years covering these crooks. Mr. Tucker, God bless pleasure you, to meet you. The media said he was crazy and didn't exist. You. Now we forced him. 120 of the world's most powerful men, heads of state from Europe, high officials of the United States government, Treasury, White House, state, defense. They're setting the world agenda now. The reason they want secrecy is because they're doing evil. Evil is done under the cover of darkness. Good works are done in the sunshine. Hi, how you doing? Good. Can you get off the property, please? Well, well, Jim, Jim has some questions for you. I need you to move off the property, please. Okay, okay. private well, property. Sure. Uh, it's a public sidewalk. Oh, yeah, we are cooperating. Thank you. Right onto the sidewalk. Yeah, there's no implication yeah. that we aren't uh, right cooperating. Right onto the sidewalk. Okay. Stay there, please? Sure, yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, Jim, Jim has some questions for you. Again, I need you to stay right on the sidewalk. Yeah. Thank you very much. We actually checked with the city. The property line's actually right here. Also, that's good. Property line's actually right here. We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. David Rockefeller. We saw David Rockefeller and uh, the car in black at the, uh, beyond the hotel and they have no, had no bodyguards. One of my friends shouted, hey Rockefeller, and he turned back uh, and he uh, was uh, afraid. <laughs> My name is Rene. I'm from uh, Manitoba. Drove about 26 hours to get here, uh, just to show my uh, that I'm against the Bilderbergers, just to fight for my freedoms, fight for my rights, uh, make sure that my children can grow up uh, in a free country. My name is Daniel Estrella, and uh, I've been uh, doing this for the last 15 years. Uh, I'm from Canada. I'm very proud of my country because, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of people covering the Bilderberg Conference. Last year. Uh, it took me 14 and a half hours to get to uh, Munich. I was pulled off the plane in Milan, I was pulled off the plane in Munich. They interrogated me four hours in both places. I was able to call a friend, a journalist in, uh, in Rome as a result of his presence and others calling the Foreign Ministry Department in Italy. They backed off and they let me go. They basically told me that they were keeping an eye on me 24 hours of the day. Uh, the little hotel where we were staying at, Jim and I, out of the 20 rooms, six were occupied, three by the CIA and three by the uh, German Secret Service. Uh, that's how serious these people are and that's how afraid they are of actually what we may be able to reveal and what we actually do reveal publicly about the Bilderberger intents. Daniel Estelin has covered the Bilderberg meetings in Europe and North America for more than 15 years. His book, Club Bilderberg, has been translated into more than 20 languages and is a global bestseller. Estelin has photographed many past Bilderberg meetings. Rockefeller frontman Henry Kissinger is always a key participant. Here you see the president of the CFR, Richard N. Haas, followed by vice chairman of Rothschild Europe, Franco Barnaby, who is speaking with Henry Kravitz. And behind them is Richard Holbrook, former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. The head of Daimler Chrysler, Jürgen Erich Schrimp, arrives by helicopter. Here, the owner of the Washington Post, Donald Graham, escorts Indra Nui, the head of PepsiCo. Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, whose father, Prince Bernhard, founded Bilderberg, is a leading figure in the group. Of course, globalist kingpin, David Rockefeller, seen here with his bodyguard, James Ford, always attends. 
The then newly appointed World Bank Chief Paul Wolfowitz is photographed at Bilderberg 2005. It has been reported that Wolfowitz had attended previous meetings while still the Deputy Secretary of Defense, a violation of the Logan Act. Under the Logan Act, it is a felony offense for any member of the federal or state government to meet with members of a foreign government without the express authority and authorization of the President or Congress. Put simply, it is illegal for members of the government to meet secretly behind closed doors with foreign power brokers due to the problems of corruption and espionage that it breeds. For this reason, many prominent politicians attend, but their names do not appear on the official list. Despite the Logan Act, the governor of New York's name, George Pataki, does appear on the list, and we were able to catch the governor on tape walking with David Rockefeller at Brook Street. Multiple staff members inside Brook Street reported to us that Hillary Clinton attended for half a day. Several armored limos with diplomatic plates did arrive with police escorts and offloaded their passengers in the underground parking garage out of the sight of the press. Former World Bank President James Wolftonson sardonically stared at our cameras. They're upset about the fact that they're being exposed. Well, I'm sure they are. I mean, look at the tinted windows. Uh, they, they don't want to be seen. They don't want even anybody to know they're here. So I'm sure they're ticked, you know, and that's why we're here to try to expose them. Do you think that they were angry that they were on the front page of the local paper today? You think they're in there reading it right now, Jim? Uh, yes, I don't think they're happy about it. They prefer nothing at all, no publicity. They pr prefer absolute secrecy. Yeah, you better look away. We're not your slaves. Did you get a list of the FNDs and everything? Or no, uh, no, I've asked for one under a slight variation of my name, and I don't know if I'll get it or not. Also, it could happen today. For the last three years, I get back to the hotel. And there's a copy there waiting for you. Well, the well, somebody who does not identify himself. Of I mean, the, uh... I really, I'm not just not revealing the source. I don't know the source myself, uh, but a fact. Uh -huh because they want the Bilderberg letterhead on it and makes a nice memento. Perfect. Alex? Yeah. That's Chalabi, eh? You think Chalabi? No, 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 I don't think. I know. It looked like Chalabi, and it was a fat, fat guy. Yeah. That was Ahmed Chalabi? Yeah. Oh, my God. Then they're really going to attack Iran. <laughs> Uh, over the last couple of years, they've been reeling with the amount of leakage that they've been experiencing, so it's getting harder and harder. But again, it will never get too hard for us because of the sources that we have inside are top-notch sources. People who are actually working for them, the Secret Service, the second layer, uh, people in the Bilderbergers, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the clerks, the, uh, the administrative office, they're there. They, you know, they are our eyes and ears, and uh, every time there's something out, we always get the information. That's uh, Francisco Pinto Valsamao. I think that's the queen. It's the queen. Yeah. Oh my god, you can't kiss her here. You see her? Yes. Oh my god. What usually happens, uh, the Secret Service guys who are protecting the, uh, the Bilderberg delegates, uh, the staff, the cooks, the chefs, when they actually get to see and to hear what some of these uh, nasty people are talking about, uh, they're the first ones to look for us and the first ones to make sure that we get the information uh, from the meeting. We, uh, again, we're very rigorous with information that does come out. We double, triple and quadruple the uh, confirm the sources, make sure that all the information checks out. A lot of the stuff, the Bill and Burgess have planted information, make sure that you know this disinformation nullifies the, the, the accuracy of the reporting, which is why we never publish the first thing we hear.
That looks like Rockefeller. The decisions that these people take, again, they not only decisions affect business community, they affect uh, politics, business, environment across the entire spectrum. And these decisions are made and taken by a very elite group of people behind closed doors this year at the Brook Street Hotel. We are not private to these decisions. We're not allowed to know what they're talking about. But we'll definitely feel the consequences of these decisions over the next 12 months when events which apparently by accident seem to happen in fact, they've been planned right here this year at Brook Street Hotel between 8th and 11th of June. What does it do when you get 120 of the most powerful people in the world getting together to have meetings with government officials? I mean, that, that's amazing. Well, it is. This is what I mean is that they're planning the corporate agenda. They're not uh, planning the uh, democratic human journey agenda, in my opinion. Mussolini had a definition is when the interests of the corporation take completely over from all other interests, and that's fascism. He said it should probably be called corporatism. Well, call it corporatism, call it fascism, call it neo-lib, neo There's a whole variety of political words, depending on which side of the stripe you come from, to start with, which describes the thing. But what they are describing is the complete end of democracy, the end of what matters to people, the end of what happens to the human journey. And for that reason, I think this is revolting. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here in Canada today to stand up against the Bilderberg Group that is attempting to get rid of the sovereignty of the United States. The truth of your world government has now been exposed. We know you are ruthless. We know you are evil. To David Rockefeller, to the Rothschild representatives here, to the Queen of the Netherlands, to all of you, we tell you, you are not our queens. You are not our kings. You are not our gods. We do not belong to you. We are not your slaves. We stand as free humans have stood since the beginning of time against the strong men, against the thugs, against the bullies. We will defeat your world government. We will defeat world taxation. We will defeat your control grid. God is on our side. I stand before the creator of the universe. And I ask the creator of the universe, as our founding fathers did in 1776, to lead God and direct us and to give us the power and the foresight and the understanding and the will to stand against your entire agenda, including your final plan of world population reduction of 80% that Henry Kissinger penned in 1973. Why do you put mercury in the vaccines, stand sodium fluoride in the water? Why? Why do you put cancer viruses in the vaccines? Why have you used depleted uranium now in four separate nations? You're arrogant. You have the sickness that elites have had throughout history in their literal and, in some cases, figurative ivory towers. You believe that you're invincible. You will and you are failing now. Your new world order will fall. Humanity will defeat you. The answer to 1984 is 1776. Yeah. Yeah. Bilderberg is an elite organization and the way it works, the, the, the protocol of the meetings is the staff, after they're vetted out, they're told exactly how they're supposed to uh, behave themselves, meaning that they can never address the attendees, they can never speak to them unless they're spoken to first, they can never look them in the eye. They have to approach them from the right side, the people who are right-handed, and from the left side, the people who are left-handed. They can never look them straight on. And uh, needless to say, all the information that is being spoken and during the conferences is under no circumstances allowed to come out. That's what they're told. They're threatened with uh, not being able to find another job anywhere in the sector if they reveal any information to the press. Richard Holbrook. Ambassador Richard Holbrook thought the peasantry wouldn't recognize him if he took a stroll off the grounds of Brook Street. Holbrook cackled when I told him that we were not his slaves. Holbrook, we're not your slaves, Holbrook. We're not your slaves. Holbrook, we don't belong to you. We're not your property. 
We're free humanity! Okay, we're gonna be going around the back here, guys. Hey guys, how you doing? There are several rings of security service. The American delegation at every Bilderberg meeting is usually protected by the CIA and the Special Division of the U.S. Army. The British delegation is protected by the MI6. Israelis usually are protected by the Mossad. The Ottawa police, in this case, working for the security, they uh, have very little, actually they don't have any information at all about what the meeting is about. They don't know who the Bilderbergs are. Then there is a, a, an elite uh, uh, private firm protecting the perimeter, doing all the dirty work, such as shooing off the photographers and, and, and bothering uh, the protesters. But, you know, that's like piddly stuff. All the heavy stuff is done by the security service, such as the CIA, MI6. Some years ago, my legs were a little bit stronger than they are now, and I crept over a fence under cover of darkness and uh, approached. Uh, the cops started uh, yelling and pointing at me, so I uh, ran with speed I didn't know I still had. And some shots were fired, but they were far above my head. I mean, they were intimidating, but they were not really trying to kill me. Not when sharp sharpshooters are fired far above, 20 feet above your head. Bilderberg was founded by David Rockefeller and the Rothschilds in Britain and Europe. Uh, they're still uh, the main powers. Baron Evelyn D. Rothschild, a male, uh, attended for many years. Rothschild is still represented. You'll see them on the list of participants. Somebody representing the Rothschild group. They are the main powers uh, behind Bilderberg. Dutch World Shell is part of the Queen's uh, fortune. Uh, of course, the Rockefellers have, have always had heavy oil interest. That was the original source of, the, of uh, their old money, of the old man. Jim just got the official Bilderberg letterhead list from his mole inside the Bilderberg group. Let's go look at it. So, Jim, you got the list. Yeah. Uh, did we identify Wolfowitz as being here because he's not on the list? No, we positively identified uh, Wolfenson. Yeah, he's on the list. Uh, yeah, there's Wolfenson right there, James yep. Wolfenson. But aren't there always people who aren't listed? Yep. Over the years, we've identified, like, sometimes one, sometimes three people who are not on their own list who uh, have attended. Now, I think what is very difficult for most people to understand is how such a small group of 125 men and a few women control a population base of 6 billion people. Actually, it's much easier than you think. These people work on what I call a systemic methodology, meaning that you take a pie, just imagine, you take an apple pie and you slice this apple pie into lots of very small pieces, and you put in front of each one of these pieces your men or women of trust, and by controlling this individual, you control an entire organization. For example, if you take Paul Wolfowitz, who runs the, uh, the World Bank, uh, through him you can control the entire organization. You don't need to control what the dishwasher or the toilet cleaner thinks or does or believes in. You just need to control what he does and what he believes in. And what he does will permeate the entire organization. And that's how you control with very, very small power base an entire global population of, of 6 billion people. Bilderberg is making great progress toward a world government. They have uh, created a super state in Europe called the European Union. They are intent on creating a Western Hemisphere Union called the American Union. NAFTA is to be expanded into every country in this hemisphere. As NAFTA expands, it will take on the role of the American Union. And only an educated, informed public can stop them in their tracks. We went into downtown Ottawa and talked to locals to learn if they were aware of the elite meeting in their city.
Hey guys, attention just for a second. I just need to tell you that a group just met here in Canada and they're trying to get rid of your sovereignty, merging you with the U.S. and Mexico. See, it, it's not funny, I'm serious. And your news isn't going to tell you about this. This is deadly serious. So I'm just letting you know and I'm telling you about it. As they say, they are the guys that run the world. They make the decisions for we and we just carry it out. Sir, did you hear about the Bilderberg Group meeting here in town, the 120 most elite people in the world? No. Hey, did you know that the elites meeting here in town right now? Have you heard about it? The 120 crime bosses? None of you heard of it. None of you guys have heard of the Bilderberg Group? They're meeting right now. In the city, around 10% of the people were aware of the New World Order agenda. When we traveled to Parliament, close to half of the people we randomly spoke to were informed. Ma'am, what did you say about the American Union? It's, it's, it's going to end up happening. We don't want it, but it's going to happen. <laughs> Why do you think? Because the Bilderberg Group runs the world. You have the Trilateral Commission that's also part of the Bilderberg, which is the uh, United States, Europe, and Asia. But most of this is public knowledge. Nobody wants to believe that there are conspiracies, uh, that yeah. world leaders are already elected before they're voted on. Uh, so here we know that Bernard Lord uh, is part of the outer circle. Um, I, I was surprised to read that uh, Harper addressed the group in 2003, uh, because my understanding was nobody gets into politics without becoming a part of the Bilderberg group. And then you find out afterwards that that is the case that they have. Well, yeah, well, Bill Clinton went there in 91, George Bush Sr. back in like 85. And Blair, same thing. Who we think that we're electing as leaders are, have already been pre-picked for us. Whether it's liberal or a conservative, they're already part of the group. Uh, they own all the horses in the race. They own the horses, and I understand that, for example, in the United States, it's a one-party system with two factions, uh, though you think it's it's two different uh, parties. Oh, it is, yeah. So It's like Bill Clinton constantly vacations with the Bushes, and they call him their son, and they actually staged all that in 92, and all that's come out. It's just all staged. They're not going to let trillions of dollars slip through their hands. The good news is people are waking up, though. When you read human history, when you study it, all, all you see is elites trying to dominate, subterfuge, Machiavellian backstabbing. And somehow in the last 50 years, they convinced Westerners that the government's fine, can do no wrong, trust them. How did this happen? <laughs> it's easy to lead sheep. I mean, people just follow. They don't want to believe these things will happen. No way. We'll just follow along with the norm. That's all. It's just an, makes it easier for everyone. What's your view on losing Canada's sovereignty? I like this country to stay as it is, and I love the United States to be there. Back in Austin, the capital of Texas, the public was frighteningly unaware of the nation's peril. Have you heard about the North American Union? Um, not really, no. I don't watch TV. No, I haven't. Interesting. I was not aware of that. I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean, so... Um, I don't think there's going to be a merger of the three nations. No, I have not. Uh, no. Uh, no, I, I didn't know. know this was happening, so... <laughs> no. Yes, I have. I have oh, you have heard about it? Yes. Yeah. After that big rally the other day, don't know about it? I don't know about anything. No, I have not. Have you heard of the European Union? I have, yes. <laughs> Are you aware of the European Union? Oh, yeah, of course. Have you heard about the European Union? Heard about them. Do you know about the European Union? No. Europe, 15 member group expanding. A what? 15 nations of Europe merging in 2000. Whatever. <laughs> For over 50 years, the Bilderberg Group constructed the European Union by stealth under the guise of trade deals. Now the elite are using the same secretive program to complete the North American Union. But this time, superstate integration is on the extreme fast track. International agreements like NAFTA, GATT, and APEC were just stepping stones in the formation of the NAU. The North American Union was officially born at Baylor University in Waco, Texas on March 23, 2005. The leaders of the United States, Mexico, and Canada told the press that they were only meeting to discuss trade. 
It soon leaked that a secret meeting had been held during the Security and Prosperity Trilateral Summit. The three governments had refused to release the secret agreement to the people. In September of 2006, their treasonous operation was blown wide open. From September 12th to September 14th in Banff, Canada, hundreds of elected and appointed government leaders from Canada, Mexico, and the United States met in secret. On the last day of the conference, someone inside the secret North American Union forum leaked the agenda. The front pages of newspapers across Canada carried the story. The Judicial Watch Foundation submitted Freedom of Information Act requests to obtain the full agenda and minutes of the secret assembly. Many federal agencies refused, citing national security. The foundation finally succeeded and did receive thousands of pages of documents. The documents marked unclassified are the blueprints of a shadow government ruling by bureaucratic and executive fiat. The pages chronicle an already operating North American Union. Transportation, law enforcement, agriculture, regulation, banking, manufacturing, construction, education, immigration, and even the military are being merged with no input from the people or their elected representatives in Congress and Parliament. One of the first items on their agenda was to stress how important it was that their plan, quote, be carried out by stealth. The controllers also talked about exploiting the public's fears of climate change to push a continent-wide tax to fund the new government. Globalist tool Robert Pasture is incessantly paraded on the world stage as the man behind the North American merger. When he testified before Congress, he pushed the idea of a continental security perimeter that erases national boundaries and merges the security apparatus. The best way to secure the United States today is not at our two borders with Mexico and Canada, but at the borders of North America as a whole. In fact, the North American Command, based in Colorado Springs, Colorado, was clearly running the meeting in Canada. For the past decade, the Pentagon has been training with Mexican and Canadian forces and has openly discussed using them inside the United States for disasters and to quell domestic unrest. There are already over 100,000 non-U.S. citizens serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. The Pentagon is now expanding its recruiting centers in Mexico, the Philippines, and Eastern Europe. Big city police departments nationwide are lobbying to change laws so they can recruit non-citizens to join the police force. What we are witnessing is a Red Dawn scenario in slow motion. Tyrants throughout history have brought in foreigners to oppress their domestic populations. When their coup by stealth was exposed, the three governments went into damage control mode. The Security and Prosperity Partnership quickly staged a show summit that was held in Ottawa, Canada in February of 2007. It is the only way that we can achieve a security and prosperity for our people is through this cooperation. We uh, actually occupy one physical space, the uh, North America. We've also had a chance as foreign ministers to talk about how we cooperate uh, in the region and indeed in the world. Protesters who were upset about losing their countries and freedoms were not tolerated. A couple of weeks ago, an Al-Qaeda supposed so ever, the Security and Prosperity Partnership has been Globalist publications have been open with their frustration that the population has not bought their latest PR stunt. As integration inside the European and American unions accelerates, the superstates themselves are being merged. On April 30th, 2007, a summit was held at the White House. The Security and Prosperity Partnership's secretive approach had alarmed the public. So this time, President Bush, German Chancellor Merkel, and EU Commission President Barroso hid their treachery in plain sight. Thank the Chancellor and Josie very much for uh, the transatlantic economic integration plan. And for that too, we need to develop a common market, common standards. So this is indeed a very important agreement 
and an agreement that also brings with it a transatlantic economic council to be a permanent body with senior people on both sides of the Atlantic that will look at all those issues in a concrete manner in which way we can make it move forward. The BBC reported that the US and EU had agreed on a single market. By announcing a new economic community integration, they were simply repeating what had been done in America and the EU on a larger scale. The accord states that the two blocs will aggressively push regulatory convergence in more than 35 areas, from financial services, intellectual property, military, education, mergers and acquisitions, they also agreed to jointly push a global carbon tax. We recognize that we have a problem with greenhouse gases. We agree there is a global threat, it's a serious threat. We agree there is the need to establish a limit to greenhouse gases. We need to discuss the possible pricing of uh, uh, CO2. Um, how can we translate this into a market economic compatible scheme? We have agreed to establish a high level group, a forum, this EU-US result is translated into the G8, uh, debated together with the outreach countries, China, um, South Africa, Brazil, among others, and India. A global solution to a global problem. If Bilderberg succeeds, America falls. All the victimized countries lose their sovereignty. Bilderberg is not a person, it's not an, uh, it's not an idea, it's an ideal, a very powerful group of people working together and from the positions of ultimate and absolute power, destroying every constitution on earth, re no matter how powerful the constitution of the nation is, that's what these people do. The African Union arose out of the African economic community, shut up in the early 1980s. The African Union is financed by a consortium of international bodies, governments, and corporations. The African Union Army serves as an enforcement arm for the New World Order's exploitation of Africa. In Asia, APEC and ASEAN have announced plans to form the Asian Union, consisting of Asian and Pacific nations having more than three billion people within its borders. APEC will become the Asian Pacific Union and the world is to be divided into three great regions for the administrative convenience of the world government in which the UN is to evolve. As the unions form individually, they are simultaneously merged to form the first planetary government. They're trying to destroy every nation on earth which is trying to promote progress because these people basically they are landowners. Uh, they don't need progress because they control the land. If you take uh, the most powerful man in London, uh, the people who belong to the uh, to the council and the committee of 300, who belong to the Billiburgers, you know, the British royalty, the Guelphs, the, the, you know, the black nobility of Venice and Genoa, these people, uh, they are landowners. The New World Order is the Old World Order. I mean, it's just the names have changed, the appearances have changed, but the concept hasn't changed. The idea is still to bring the men back, kicking and screaming back to the Middle Ages, post-industrial age world order. One of the things that is very shocking to most Americans is the fact that the United Nations Global Biodiversity Assessment, which came out in 1995, clearly shows that in order to protect planet Earth, we have to go back to a feudal system. They actually said that in the document. To craft a modern feudal society, the globalists are implementing a standardized North American Union ID card to track, trace, and control their serfs as they travel throughout the three regions of the NAU. Building on the massive displacement of humanity caused by globalization, the New World Order is rapidly constructing the physical infrastructure of the North American Union the NAFTA Superhighway Control Grid. I'm Arthur Peterson, Colonel Retired, the Army. I see things today that are happening that would make my friend who died in World War II turned over in their grave. To think that people would even consider confiscating land of farmers and ranchers and taking their homes away from them to turn it over to a foreign company in Spain, which was controlled by Don Carlos, I understand, a notorious socialist, and they get the tolls on Texas land for 50 years. 
The proposed Trans-Texas Corridor would be a patchwork of superhighways and railroads stretching 4,000 miles from the border of Mexico, cutting through Texas to Oklahoma. A lease has been signed that would make Texas Highway 121 a toll road. A private Spanish company won the bid to build and collect the tolls for the next 50 years. These deals with private companies are being negotiated largely in secret. And many state lawmakers are worried taxpayers are being sold down the road. Critics say it's a threat to our national security. It's part of a plan for a North American integration being carried out by government and corporate elites without congressional or voter approval. We took to the air over Central Texas to get a bird's eye view of the Trans-Texas Corridor, which is under construction and will form the heart of the Trans-NAFTA Superhighway System. History repeats itself. 2,000 years ago, all roads led to Rome. Rome constructed and maintained more than 10,000 miles of roads throughout its empire. The roads were used to project Roman military power, to control commerce, and to bind the nations and peoples they ruled. Rome also demanded tribute. Roman subjects from Albion to Judea were forced to pay a tax to use the roads. The Romans would then use the tax to dominate their subjects. Today's superhighways are a powerful tool in the globalist arsenal. They are instrumental in tearing down national borders and merging nation states into larger confederations. Foreign governments and corporations are predatorily seizing infrastructure across North America, but nowhere has their attack been greater than in Texas. Texas is the front line. Over 8,000 miles of existing roads and land are being handed over to government-backed foreign companies. Foreign companies buy the legislators, who then turn over complete control to the same foreigners who finance their campaigns. Government power is then illegally transferred to unelected quasi-governmental regional boards that circumvent local governments and the will of the people. The next stage of this world government plan is to have a transportation control and that is called the NAFTA Superhighway, or in Texas called the Trans-Texas Corridor. It confiscates 584,000 acres of land to be transferred into a control of a Spanish company which will collect tolls in Texas for the next 50 years, and there's no limit in the amount of tolls that can be collected. More than 80 federal and state highways have been designated as international arteries. The I-35 NAFTA Corridor starts deep inside Mexico and travels through the middle of the United States and ends in central Canada. Container ships from Asia dump their cargo on the Pacific side of Mexico. It then travels duty-free by rail to the new Kansas City inland port, now considered sovereign soil of Mexico, in the heart of the United States. Under international agreements, predominantly foreign companies are placing tolls on already existing paid-for roads. Federal, state, and corporate documents show that they will then use the revenue raised to build up the transportation infrastructure of Mexico, not the United States or Canada, so foreign-made products can pour in even faster from Mexico. Revenues raised will also be used to fund the fledgling North American Union and its growing bureaucracy. Bottom line, they're using our own money to enslave us. First of all, they're proposing a North American tribunal, which would be similar to what we have in Chapter 11 of the NAFTA agreement, which is trumped by international law. The U.S. Supreme Court and our Constitution could potentially be rendered invalid, and what we would have is new North American business law that would trump what we have here in the United States. What is also interesting to note that the NAFTA headquarters is in Mexico and controls the United States trade and rules against the United States Congress and no one seems to challenge it. 
it's very probable and probably inevitable that our right to bear arms would be challenged in a North American court. So this is just an example of what's happening and what's being proposed. We want to keep our trial by jury system. We want to keep our right to keep and bear arms. We want a system where we have a Supreme Court and not have a tribunal that uh, will be superior to the Supreme Court. In 2005, Centra, a Spanish-owned company, signed a secret agreement with the Texas Department of Transportation to erect toll roads on existing roads and to toll new roads that were completely paid for by tax dollars. There are people, believe it or not, in Texas who don't know what the Trans-Texas Corridor is. Right. TTC 69, which they'll have the environmental hearing starting this spring on, runs through my part of the state. And there are people over there who have no idea what's fixing to come in their backyard. TexDOT, an unelected state agency, claimed that the agreement with the foreign company was even secret from the Texas legislature. When the truth came out, newspapers across the state called for heads to roll politically. Centra's response was to have its Australian subsidiary make its first U.S. newspaper buy. Every newspaper they bought was along branches of the Trans-Texas Corridor and had been critical of the toll road plan. The cost of 40 or 50 newspapers is nothing compared to the profits that'll be made. Just phase one alone of the state toll road plan is estimated to raise more than $200 billion in just the first 15 years. And Texas is only a small part of the global panorama. A combine of transnational companies is aggressively consolidating public finance infrastructure worldwide. And the same interest are erecting a world government according to their rules. A literal wonderland of corporate corruption where governments simply act as vacuum cleaners, sucking up the wealth and resources of the middle class and transferring it to offshore bank accounts leaving behind a cultural and economic wasteland of easily managed slaves. The whole purpose about the North American Free Trade Agreement is not about trade, it's about control. Control of people. Capital is even worse. Control of people. It's not about trade, it's subsidized trade with taxpayers' funds. This thing started here. And to save this country, we kill this damn thing here. To stop it here in Texas, we stop the new world order right here in Texas. Polls consistently show that over 90% of the people are against the NAFTA highway systems and its toll roads. As the people learned of the threat, they got angry and took action. Our ranch is part of the original Spanish land grant, and I would love to not have to give it back to Spain. <laughs> Opponents of a proposed superhighway today held a major protest. A majority of Texas counties have voted to resist the plan for a North American Union and have vowed to block the construction of its infrastructure. The heck we already know in a law that was passed by a subservient United States Congress where practically nobody in the entire Congress stood up and said no, they've already passed the law saying all their driver's licenses are going to be chipped. Well, I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to carry in a driver's license that's got a chip in it so big brothers can walk everywhere I go and do and see everything I do. No, no, hell no. No, all of it. No, no. We, the people, own this plot of ground. We, the people, own those trees there. We, the people, own our beautiful Texas. And we are not going to let a bunch of crooks and robber barons take our beautiful Texas away from us. Hell no. FID tracker chips embedded in state inspection stickers and toll tags are already being used to track the population. The new system is also meant to control growth and steer development through so-called smart growth. 
smart growth, which is nothing more than an effort to bring control into the cities. You have the rewilding of America in the, in the Wildlands Project, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is to control our rural population. Toll roads on interstate highways nationwide are walling off exit ramps to small towns and rural communities and are creating ghost towns by design. This trend is accelerating under the NAFTA highway system and is meant to rewild more than half the country. All of these things are designed to bring more and more control to bureaucracies rather than to the independent individual, the sovereign individual of this nation. What brought me into this whole discussion was the fact that while I was doing this multi-million dollar research effort in the 1980s and early 1990s, I became aware of an agenda basically to lock up one half of the United States in the wilderness corridors and reserves. What's called the Wildlands Project, but it was also a key cornerstone of the U.S. The United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. It was during that study in which I began to realize that this was not an effort to protect the environment, but an effort to control you and I. They were dividing the United States up into little compartments in which they would rip out roads, which they would rip out whole communities and put them in back in the wilderness. The federal highway system was designed by Pentagon war planners in the 1950s to serve as a rapid deployment conduit to move ground forces for the defense of the United States during invasion. The unconstitutional Northern Command is now using the highway system as a force projection matrix to dominate populations across the United States. Through federally funded emergency command centers, county and city governments are being quietly federalized nationwide. Billions of dollars per city is being spent to install millions of surveillance cameras. Every town and hamlet, no matter how small or remote, is surveilled. License plate reading software tracks Americans' movements wherever they go. New systems are being deployed that scan your face, read your lips, and analyze your walk. Under the Treasonous Military Commissions Act, American citizens can be secretly arrested, stripped of citizenship, flown to offshore torture camps, and secretly executed. Under Section 802 of the Patriot Act, all misdemeanors are considered terrorism. Federal police squads called Viper Teams randomly force Americans to line up and show their papers. From the sidewalks of Miami to the subways of New York to the streets of Houston, Texas, citizens are being searched by heavily armed gangs of paramilitary police. Long before 9-11, the Pentagon was aggressively violating the federal law that bars the military from policing the American people. Coast to coast for more than two decades, teams of troops would just appear out of nowhere and randomly stop cars and search pedestrians. The acclamation accelerated with regular army searching bags at the Super Bowl and the Kentucky Derby, as well as other high profile events. Then President Bush signed a Defense Authorization Act, which radically increased the funding for the already bloated shadow government. In the act, the executive branch formally announced that it was preparing for domestic insurrection and went on to preemptively strip the state governors and legislatures of their powers. The federal government is openly announcing that it is the only authority as it treats the people and the states as enemies. Then on May 9, 2007, President Bush unlawfully granted himself new powers, and the presidency officially became a 
fiat dictatorship. In the past, continuity of government has been shared by the legislative, judicial, and executive branches of government. Now, all power resides with the president for the smallest of reasons, including, in the document's own text, any incident in the world, regardless of location, that affects population, infrastructure, environment, economy, or government functions can trigger, at the president's will, total martial law. It is important to add that the president is merely a puppet of the global crime syndicate and may not use the new powers, but simply pass them on for use by future puppet administrations. Приобретена эта победа. Не забывайте принесенных вами жертв. You must teach people to love their leader. This is the only most important. Why don't we learn from the mistakes of our ancestors? Why does humankind find itself bound in a cycle of bloodshed and enslavement? Predatory elites have always rationalized their oppression by claiming that they are superior and have the divine right to rule, when all they really are is a gaggle of ruthless psychopaths parasitically feeding on the host population until their cancerous movement causes the collapse of the host. There have been thousands of tyrannical governments in history, and less than 10 that can truly be called free. In the 20th century alone, over 150 million people were murdered at the hands of the state. In Russia, the Red Terror consumed the lives of more than 60 million men, women, and children. Hitler's war killed 22 million. During Mao Zedong's reign alone, more than 60 million peasant farmers were killed. And the list goes on. 300,000 innocent civilians killed in Guatemala. More than 2 million souls brutally murdered by the government of Cambodia. 1,500,000 killed in Turkey. 300,000 in Uganda. 800,000 plus hacked to death with machetes in Rwanda. Sadly, there are too many examples of innocent families being exterminated by their governments on an industrial scale to name them all. It is a historical fact that the state is the number one cause of unnatural death. If you take the 150 million people killed by power-mad government in the last century and divide it by 100,000, the number of souls lost would fill the biggest sports stadium packed with 100,000 screaming fans 1,500 times over. That's 1,500 sports stadiums crammed with 100,000 people each, all exterminated. For those who think it can't happen here or won't happen to them, you have been warned. The carnage witnessed in the last hundred years was only the preparatory phase of the New World Order's master plan. Hitler and Stalin's crimes are now part of history. The communist Chinese system of evil is not content with racking up the highest death toll in history. The mass murder and enslavement is still going on today and enjoys the full support and sanction of the New World Order. The 
communist China serves as a globalist laboratory, a proving ground where 1.4 billion people live out their lives as guinea pigs who serve as test subjects for the formulation of the brave new world. U.S. and British forces worked closely with Mao Zedong during World War II, and at the end of the war, they secretly backed Mao in driving out Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist. The OSS, and then the CIA, believed that Mao would have a stabilizing effect. Bill Clinton's mentor and Georgetown University political science professor Carol Quigley explained in his book, Tragedy and Hope, how the Anglo-American roundtable groups backed every brand of authoritarianism, from communism to fascism, to ensure that a centralized government dominates the population and the economy as planned. The elite are monopoly men. They seek to create monopolies and dominate populations through the barrel of a gun. In their writings, the leadership of the New World Order has continuously heaped praise on the corrupt communist Chinese model. In August of 1973, in an article written by David Rockefeller for the New York Times, Rockefeller openly lauds and endorses Mao Zedong's actions while celebrating their command and control system. Whatever the price of the Chinese Revolution, it has obviously succeeded not only in producing more efficient and dedicated administration, but also in fostering high morale and community of purpose. The social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in history. David Rockefeller, New York Times, August 10, 1973. Communist China is the model, planned society for the New World Order. China has received more United Nations awards for its policies and form of governance than any other nation. In the eyes of globalist planners, authoritarian China is the future. China adopted the dreaded one-child policy due to lobbying from a consortium of eugenics organizations, which includes Planned Parenthood and the United Nations. Couples that have more than one child face heavy fines and imprisonment. The practice of forced abortion in China, coupled with the cultural desire to have a male child, has plunged China into a deepening crisis where there are 30 million more men than women. The Chinese police state ruthlessly crushes all forms of dissent. Underground churches, Falun Gong practitioners, Striking factory workers are all sent to forced labor camps. Their blood and tissue types are cataloged in preparation for organ harvesting. The Chinese government then sells the prisoners' organs to the highest bidder on the world market. If a wealthy patient chooses to fly into China, the prisoner is killed and the organs are implanted. If the organs are being flown out of the country, a mobile execution van extracts the organs on the way to the waiting aircraft. The social engineers of China aggressively euthanize the elderly and disabled. China is merely following the globalist blueprint for the world. The same system of total dehumanization is quietly being phased in worldwide. Depopulation should be the highest priority of foreign policy towards the third world. Henry Kissinger, 1974. Uh, there's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of, of the world. Now, None of this may succeed this time, but this to me is sort of the outline by which someday in the next few years a solution will emerge. Where does this mindset come from? Why do the elites kill the largest masses of people when no one is resisting them, when they've already attained total control? What ideology drives the elite psychopath? Since Plato's time 2,400 years ago, 
state planners have openly proclaimed their desire to control every detail of the commoner's life. From breeding programs to mass extermination of undesirables, the dark dream has continued on for millennia. The scientific rationale for tyranny has always been attractive to elites because it creates a convenient excuse for treating their fellow man as lower than animals. Robert Thomas Malthus, famous for saying that a mass food collapse would be helpful because it would wipe out the poor. His fictional scenario would later be called a Malthusian catastrophe. Malthus is important because his ideas led to the rise of a new scientific field that would dominate the course of human history for the next 200 plus years. Charles Darwin, an admirer of the Malthusian catastrophe model, developed the theory of evolution, its chief tenet being the survival of the fittest. With the help of T.H. Huxley, known as Darwin's bulldog for his strong support of Darwin's theories, Darwin's theories were pushed into wide acceptance among key scientific circles throughout England and then the world. Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, credited as the father of eugenics, saw an opportunity to advance mankind by taking the reins of Darwin's evolution theory and applied social principles to develop social Darwinism. The families, Darwin, Galton, Huxley, and Wedgwood were so obsessed with their new social design theory that they pledged their families would only breed with each other. They falsely predicted that within only a few generations, they would produce supermen. The emerging pseudoscience was only codifying the practice of inbreeding, already popular within elites for millennia. The four families experiment was a disaster. Within only two generations of inbreeding, close to 90% of their offspring either died at birth or were seriously mentally or physically handicapped. The moneyed class of the planet, and particularly the royal families of the world, who were already obsessed with breeding and filled with a predatory disdain for the underclass, seized on the new science and began aggressively enforcing its aims worldwide. Biometrics appears to be a new science, but it was actually developed by Galton back in the 1870s as a way to track racial traits and genetic histories, and as a way to decide who would be licensed to breed. In 1904, the Cold Springs Harbor Research Facility was started in the United States by eugenicist Charles Davenport with the funding of prominent robber barons Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Harriman. In 1907, the first sterilization laws were passed in the United States. Citizens with mild deformities or low test scores on their report cards were arrested and forcibly sterilized. You're 17, aren't you, Alice? Yes, but what have you done with my folks? Well, we're trying to help them, Alice, and you too. They were taken to the hospital this afternoon. Hospital? Wasn't well, one of them sick this morning? We thought it necessary to present your family's case to the State Medical Commission. Not to an examination, they decided there was but one important action to take. To have your entire family sterilized. Why, well, what's that? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, in this state, we have a law which provides for such people to have an operation so there won't be any more children. I see. Now, we've placed your brothers in institutions where they'll be properly cared for. You can go back to your job soon. I'll arrange to have it held open for you. But... I'm keeping my job. I'm not going anywhere. Now, well, you're going to the hospital, too, Alice. And you mean they're going to stop me from having children ever? Exactly. I'm all right, I tell you. I won't go to any hospital. We don't want any trouble with you, young woman. If you refuse to go, the officer here will take you by force. In 1910, the U.S. Eugenics Record Office was set up. By then, the British had created the first network of social workers expressly to serve as spies and enforcers of the eugenics race cult that was rapidly taking control of Western society. The social workers would decide who would have their children taken away, who would be sterilized, and in some cases, who would be quietly murdered.
In 1911, the Rockefeller family exports eugenics to Germany by bankrolling the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which later would form a central pillar in the Third Reich. At the 1912 International Eugenics Conference in London, eugenics becomes an international craze and gains superstar status. The futurist and best-selling sci-fi author H.G. Wells had studied biology under top eugenicist and was spreading the new faith worldwide. In 1916, H.G. Wells' lover, Margaret Sanger, starts her promotion of eugenics in the United States. In 1923, Sanger receives massive funding from the Rockefeller family. Sanger wrote to fellow eugenicist Clarence J. Gamble that black leaders would need to be recruited to act as front men in sterilization programs directed against black communities. In 1924, Hitler pins Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, and credits U.S. eugenicist as his inspiration. Hitler even wrote a fan letter to American eugenicist and conservationist Madison Grant, calling his race-based book, The Passing of the Great Race, his Bible. Hitler developed the plan for mass extermination of the Jews and what he called other sub-races, as well as the handicapped from Grant. By 1927, eugenics hit the mainstream. The so-called science was aggressively pushed through contests at schools, churches, and at state fairs. Churches competed in contests with big cash prizes to see who could best implement eugenics into their sermons. Major denominations then tell Americans that Jesus is for eugenics. That same year in the United States, more than 25 states passed forced sterilization laws, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of brutal sterilization policies. When Hitler came to power in 1933, one of his first acts was to pass national eugenics laws modeled after laws in the United States. The 1934 film, Tomorrow's Children, brought the eugenics agenda to the silver screen in the United States. In the case of Miss Mason, I can see no reason for the operation that's been recommended. The girl is perfectly normal. She's hardworking and has a good reputation. Do you know anything about her family background? Oh, yes, Your Honor, I do. There are several other children, aren't there? Yes. What is their condition? One is a cripple, two others might be classed as feeble-minded. Isn't the oldest son in jail? Oh, yes, I believe so. And knowing all that, you still contend that this girl should be allowed to bring more people like that into the world? She's sound, Your Honor. She's not anything like the rest. Surely she should be given a chance to work out her own salvation. I can't agree with you, Doctor. Suppose she is normal. The chances are that her children will inherit the family taint. Isn't that possible? But, Your Honor, I... I'm sorry, Doctor. Three generations of unfit are enough. Petition not allowed. By 1936, Germany had become the world leader in eugenics for taking effective actions to sterilize and euthanize hundreds of thousands of victims. The big three of American eugenics, Davenport, Laughlin, and Goethe, were dispatched by the Rockefellers to Germany, where they advised the Nazis on the fine-tuning of their extermination system. With the strong support of the U.S. and England, Germany had gone over the edge and tens of millions would pay with their lives. At the end of the war, the Allies protected from prosecution the very Nazi scientist that had tortured thousands of people to death. The Nazi brand of eugenics had embarrassed the elites, but they had no intention of stopping their plans. The Allies literally fought with each other over who would get top Nazi eugenicist. It didn't matter if the SS doctors had tortured tens of thousands to death, they were free to go. The Angel of Death, Joseph Mingala, and his boss, Otmar von Verscher, were not prosecuted, and von Verscher even continued his work in Germany after the war. Eugenicists were angry that their great work had been exposed they then scrambled to camouflage their agenda. Eugenics Quarterly became Social Biology. The American Birth Control League became Planned Parenthood. 
new terms like transhumanism, population control, sustainability, conservation, and environmentalism replaced racial hygiene and social Darwinism. Many eugenicists of the previous period engaged in what they called crypto-eugenics. Purposefully taking their eugenics beliefs underground, they became highly respected anthropologists, biologists, and geneticists in the post-war world. The Allies then smuggled thousands of Nazi scientists out of Germany and placed them in key scientific positions ranging from bioweapons to rocketry throughout the military-industrial complex. The founder of IBM was a devout follower of Hitler. Thomas J. Watson had supplied his punch card computers and IBM technicians to the Nazis for use in the death camps. Tattoos on camp victims were IBM human identification numbers which fed into the computers. IBM had used similar punch card systems as early as 1928 in a Jamaican race mixing study. The first real computers were literally invented by a eugenicist for eugenics. UN chieftain and unrepentant eugenicist Julian Huxley argued that since the leaders of eugenics had founded the environmental and conservation movements, that they should be used as vehicles in the formation of a world government. Just as H.G. Wells had envisioned, this government would be controlled by a scientific dictatorship and would be guided by the principles of eugenics. Huxley created the World Wildlife Fund with Bilderberg founder and former SS officer Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands and Prince Philip of England. In the event that I am reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. Prince Philip, reported by Deutsche Press Agentur, DPA, August 1988. Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World and brother of Julian Huxley, gave a speech at Berkeley in 1962, shortly before his death. He admitted that his best-selling book, Brave New World, written in 1932, was based not on fiction, but on what the elite were actually planning to implement. And here I would like uh, briefly to, uh, to compare well, the parable of Brave New World with uh, another parable which was put forth more recently uh, in uh, George Orwell's book, 1984. I'm inclined to think that uh, the scientific dictatorships of the future, and I think there are going to be scientific dictatorships in many parts of the world, will be probably a good deal nearer to the Brave New World pattern uh, than to the uh, 1984 pattern. They will be a good deal nearer, not because of any humanitarian qualms in the scientific dictators, but simply because the Brave New World pattern is probably a good deal more efficient than the other. But if you can uh, get people to consent to the state of affairs in which they are living, the state of servitude, the state of being, well, it seems to me that the, the nature of the ultimate revolution with which we are now faced is precisely this, uh, that we are in process of developing a whole uh, series of techniques which uh, will enable the controlling oligarchy, who have always existed and presumably always will exist, uh, to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, people can be made to enjoy a state of affairs which, by any decent standard, they ought not to enjoy. And uh, these uh, methods, I, I think, are a real a refinement on the older methods of terror because they combine methods of terror with methods of acceptance. But then there are, there are various other methods which one can think of. Uh, there is, for example, the pharmacological method. This, this was one of the things I, I talked about in, in Brave New World. Uh, and uh, the result would be that uh, 
Uh, I mean, you can imagine a, a euphoric which would make people thoroughly happy even in the most abominable circumstances. I mean, they, these things are possible. The elite have left a massive wave of destruction behind them as they cold-bloodedly experiment on civilian populations as if we are lab rats. A string of congressional investigations has uncovered more than 20,000 secret tests that were carried out against the American people between 1910 and 2000. One well-known eugenic study, the Tuskegee Syphilis Project, killed hundreds of blacks and spanned 40 years until whistleblowers exposed it in 1972. From 1943 until present, the British have tested lethal nerve gas on their own personnel on land, air, and sea. Many died instantly. Still others died grueling deaths over several years. The federal government commissioned secret radiation experiments on thousands of non-consenting patients. Hundreds of hospitals in the U.S. injected healthy men, women, and children with uranium and plutonium at dosage levels ranging from non-therapeutic to lethal, killing many of the test subjects. Pregnant wives of GIs were given vitamins by base doctors that actually consisted of highly radioactive uranium-239 and plutonium-241, resulting in violent miscarriages and the death of the mothers. Soldiers, sailors, and Marines were used as guinea pigs in hundreds of atomic and hydrogen bomb tests. Patriotic Americans were radiated side by side with lab animals. Pilots were forced to repeatedly fly through mushroom clouds of DNA destroying radiation. From 1951 to 1961, the U.S. Army paid Israel's health ministry three million lira to conduct radiation testing on Sephardic children that immigrated to Israel. The government-run public schools would tell the children that they were going to get a medical checkup and that they were receiving an x-ray. The Pentagon had already radiated more than 4,000 institutionalized children in the United States, many of which had died. More than 110,000 of the darker-skinned Jews were given 35,000 times the maximum dose of x-rays to the head repeatedly. Many of the children died within months. All of them lost their hair. Some still live today and endure excruciating health problems. The covert testing of chemical, biological, and radiological agents on unsuspecting populations continues worldwide today. From 1940 to 1979, the vast majority of the British population was sprayed by aircraft more than 2,000 times with deadly chemicals and microorganisms without ever being told. In 1968, the Pentagon tested a deadly bioweapon on New York subways place personnel in local hospitals to monitor the effects. Aggressive sterilization of men and women continued in many states until the mid-1980s. The United States and England are currently testing pesticides and highly toxic experimental drugs on tens of thousands of healthy foster children, many of which die as a result of the experiments. Prisons across the nation have forced inmates to participate in grisly experiments, ranging from pesticide studies to having tablets of dioxin sewn into their backs. Gradually, by selective breeding, the congenital differences between rulers and ruled will increase until they become almost different species, 
a revolt of the plebs would become as unthinkable as an organized insurrection of sheep against the practice of eating mutton. Bertrand Russell. H.G. Wells, Aldous Huxley, Bertrand Russell, and hundreds of other eugenicists constantly bragged about how the establishment believed themselves to be a separate, more advanced species than the common man. Top eugenicists were bold enough to admit that their real goal was not improving the heredity of the commoner, but to further dumb them down so that they could be more manageable. Nobel Prize winner Russell wrote at length about how vaccinations filled with mercury and other brain damaging compounds would induce partial chemical lobotomies and develop a servile zombie population. Diet, injections, and injunctions will combine from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable, and any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. Bertrand Russell. Over a hundred years ago, eugenicist social planners said that they'd use mind-altering drugs to control the population. By 2007, more than 20% of the U.S. population were on some type of prescription antidepressant. But in the case of foster children, a sector where the state has total control, at least two-thirds are forced to take a cocktail made up of, on average, seven psychotropic drugs. Chairman of the Texas Society of Psychiatric Physicians, Joe Burkett, testified before the State House Select Committee hearing on psychotropic drugs in foster care and shocked the public when he said that two-thirds of foster children in Texas had been placed on psychiatric drugs because they were very, very sick from a bad gene pool. A lot of these kids come from bad gene pools. They don't have stable parents making good decisions. Besides the gene pools, they've then been traumatized by abuse, neglect, and problems, and then they've been traumatized by separation, and all those things predispose to mental illness. The Western world is now implementing eugenics pre-crime policies. Fetuses are now being pre-screened according to family histories of crime. From Portland, Oregon to London, England, Child Protective Services are enrolling newborn children into criminal databases at birth and forcing them to attend probation hearings at age two. The overlords of scientific dictatorship are ruthlessly prosecuting a war on our most defenseless. In December of 1974, the U.S. government made third world population reduction a central national security issue. The operation plan titled National Security Study Memorandum 200 was simply a regurgitation of the British Commission on Population created by King George VI of England in 1944 which openly stated that populous third world nations posed a threat to the international elite's monopoly of global power. The Kissinger authored U.S. plan targeted 13 key countries where massive population reduction was called for. Kissinger recommended that IMF and World Bank loans be given on condition that nations initiate aggressive population control programs such as sterilization. Kissinger also recommended that food be used as a weapon and that instigating wars was also a helpful tool in reducing population. In 1972, the Nixon White House also implemented a eugenics policy which was directed by George Herbert Walker Bush, then United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Bush advised China on the formulation of their one-child policy and directed the federal government to forcibly sterilize more than 40% of Native American women on reservations. The Bilderberg-dominated Club of Rome advocated environmentalism as the best front to implement population reduction. Western populations would accept serfdom if it was packaged as saving the earth. industrialization of Africa, Asia, and Latin America could be blocked. Citizens would more willingly give up their national sovereignty if it were sold as a way to help the planet. The think tank also concocted the peak oil fraud as a way to create artificial scarcity. And the Club of Rome has been aggressively pushing a global carbon tax as a way to fund their planetary government. In the draft copy of the United Nations Global Biodiversity Assessment, it states 
very clearly that we must reduce the human population from what's current level of about six billion people down to about one billion people. In the 1970s, South Africa developed race-specific bioweapons to target blacks and Asians, and then subsequently sold the technology to Israel in the mid-1980s. In September of 2000, the Project for a New American Century published a document in which Dick Cheney described race-specific bioweapons as politically useful tools. And somebody mentioned, well, why would they want to reduce the human population when that means less money for them? Most people have no idea. They're not after money. They have all the money they need. They're after power. That's their aphrodisiac. The overlords of the New World Order are now aggressively pushing for a worldwide one-child policy. The Chinese one-child policy was phased in gradually. In the 60s, when it began, you only had to pay a tax penalty. Only later did they imprison you if you had more than one child. Now the exact same proposals to penalize couples who have more than one child are being made in the United States, England, and Europe. In the push to reduce global warming, children, according to some, are the new culprits. A think tank in the UK says too many kids are what's making the planet worse, saying large families, anything over two children really, should be frowned upon as an environmental no-no, uh, akin to not reusing your plastic bags, driving one of those big gas-guzzling cars, uh, taking long trips overseas. The UK, in fact, has negative growth. I think Canada does too that still, families in our rich countries shouldn't have more than two kids. In 1998, Ted Turner pledged to give more than one billion to the United Nations to be spent in the implementation of population reduction policies planet-wide. In 1999, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave $2.2 billion to Planned Parenthood, the United Nations Population Fund, and other population reduction groups. By 2007, the Gates had given more than $30 billion, almost exclusively, to population control groups. The controlled corporate press cynically reported that the Gates were giving the money to help third world children. Bill and Melinda Gates were dethroned as the world's most generous philanthropists when their friend and fellow population reduction enthusiast, Warren Buffett, gave $37 billion to fund an army of population control groups. And I actually think the world will be much better when there's only 10 or 20% of us left. Dr. Eric Bianca. Prominent University of Texas biologist, Dr. Eric Bianca, while receiving an award from the Texas Academy of Science, said that the worldwide AIDS pandemic was, quote, no good, it's too slow, and went on to laud the virtues of Ebola because it would kill 90% of the world population quickly. When his statements erupted into a national controversy, his graduate students defended him, stating that Pianca was too conservative and that all humans should be killed. But most frightening was the fact that in a crowd of over 1,000 prominent scientists, local newspapers reported that 95% of those in attendance gave Bianca sustained standing ovations every time he extolled the virtues of mass culling microbes and man's destruction. China was able to turn the corner and become the leading world superpower because they have a police state and they are able to force people to stop reproducing. Dr. Eric R. Pianca. The eugenics movement has now shaken off much of its Nazi baggage and is using people's legitimate concern about the environment as a cloak to conceal their real agenda. Everyone wants to breathe clean air and have good water. The controllers of the environmental movement have done nothing but co-op people's concerns and parlay it into support for global policies that further destabilize the third world and create untold misery. 
landowning, environmental, and conservation groups are now the biggest private landowners in the world. They lobby government to take property away from local populations, only to develop it themselves later. When the U.S. military dumps millions of gallons of nerve gas on the east coast of the U.S., they don't say a word. Thousands of companies are creating transgenetic cross-species hybrids, splicing plants, animals, and insects, and releasing the new organisms into the global biosphere, vandalizing the very genetic code of the planet. And large environmental organizations do nothing. The corporate elite of the planet intensified their push for a global taxation system with a year-long buildup to the live Earth hysteria held on July 7, 2007 on seven continents. World leaders announced that saving the Earth was the new organizing principle for humanity and hailed it as the planet's new religion. They claimed that CO2, which plants breathe, was killing the Earth and that we must reduce the number of children we have to curtail our carbon footprint. Countries across the world marked the day by passing new carbon tax schemes and raising taxes on gasoline, natural gas, and electricity. It is a scientific fact that the sun is the main driver of planetary climate, and the measurements are clear. The sun is becoming hotter, brighter. It has been slowly increasing thermal output in the last hundred years, causing warming not just on Earth, but throughout the solar system. But the scientific facts and even the order of the planets didn't matter to one of the chief organizers of live Earth, David Mayer de Rothschild, heir to the British arm of the Rothschild fortune, when we spoke to him. When I called Rothschild on the order of the planets, he just laughed, thinking the audience wouldn't get it. He continued to count on the population's ignorance and claimed that the global warming lobby has nothing to do with carbon taxes. I guess he hadn't spoken with his good personal friend, Al Gore. Global warming, the time for debate is over. But I think what you have to realize is that, that being environmentally sensitive and making money aren't mutually exclusive. There's a lot of money to be made in, 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 in addressing this issue. But you guys are gobbling up all the world's concern to just simply line your pockets and make kids read your book in schools and do all this. It's a business, just like you said, Rothschild. It's not. Do you think I make any money out of this? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Your great, great, great grand, your, your money changing ancestors did. They're in Germany, Red Shield, and I'm calling you out, Red Shield. We know it's a scam. A pollution-based tax system, principally CO2. We're causing it mainly, vast majority of it. The consequences are bad and will be catastrophic unless we act. Uh, the polar ice caps of Mars have, are receding at several miles a year, much faster than ours and that the moons of Saturn and Jupiter are melting. In fact, several of their moons were ice and are now liquid seas. Now, how are SUVs causing that, David Rothschild? That's because those planets are closer to the sun, my friend. <laughs> no, um, Jupiter yeah. and Saturn are not closer to the sun. Neither is Mars. Yes, sir. I think you'll find, right, that the very simple matter, and what I wanted to say, and this is my final point, forget your taxation theory, because actually it's not taxation. Put a price on the carbon. A tax is the best way. Cap and trade can also do it. If there were a carbon-based tax, mm -hmm. would there be a need for a, a, an economy-wide cap and trade system? They are not either or. We can do both. I am in favor of both. The architects of the New World Order are in a race to complete the structure of world government so they can suppress the independent development of technologies that threaten their monopoly of power, while at the same time steering new developments in the direction the architects chart for humanity. The technocrats call their governing system the final revolution because in the past, empires were enforced militarily. 
Now enforcement is primarily psychological and economic, and society itself is a construct of the elite who operate outside the controlled paradigm and control the civilization within, just as a child maintains the environment of a fish tank. We are like lab rats living out our entire existence, never questioning the confines of the cage or the scientists who experiment on us. New World Order engineers have hijacked human destiny. Its controllers have closely studied human behavior for more than a hundred years and are now steering us with expert control, using our primitive drives and desires as levers. They have developed their mind control systems to the point of being able to control the average unconscious person like a car. Eugenics dominated the 20th century. Its ruthless spirit has now metastasized into the fields of genetics, nanotech, and robotics. But that's not surprising. From their inception, all three disciplines have been dominated by eugenicists. The billionaire founder of Sun Microsystems, Bill Joy, courageously went public in 2000 to warn of a cancerous consensus among the technocratic elite that at best humanity would be completely enslaved by the year 2030, and at worst, mass extermination of everyone but the elite would take place. A who's who of the techno elite are members of what is known as the transhumanist or posthumanist movement. Many of its adherents see only the beneficial aspects of technology's exponential rise, like bringing sight to the blind, sound to the deaf, and longer life for all. But what many of them don't know is that master eugenicist Julian Huxley founded transhumanism and that society's controllers openly admit that the new system is designed to progress into absolute tyranny. Leading transhumanist Ray Kurzweil boasts that technological advancements will allow those that can afford it to live forever, but admits that most won't be able to keep up with the new master race. The drive for world government is now all about who will control and have access to radical life extension systems. Biological evolution is too slow for the human species. Over the next few decades, it's going to be left in the dust. Transhumanists believe that they will attain the fountain of youth by merging with technology. Now, it may be within their reach. Decades ago, transhumanists said that if you did not accept augmentation or enhancements, you would no longer be able to get jobs. And now it's happening today. The elite who occupy the commanding heights of digital reality are suicidal nihilists. Suicidal nihilists know that there is no longer any substantive purpose to their willing, but they would always prefer to go on willing than not to act at all. They can very happily ally themselves with a the notion of nuclear holocaust or perfect exterminism. Technology has become so powerful in its capacity for destruction that free humanity cannot afford to let psychopathic technocrats with delusions of grandeur repeat the mistakes of their forebears, because it is highly probable that this time they may destroy everything, including themselves in their mad rush for godhood. In this film, we have chronicled the overlord's bloody orgy of experimentation, which already claimed the lives of more than 150 million people in the 20th century. And now they are promising to deliver an invincible tyranny that will dwarf their past exploits. In the days of World War II, there were sovereign nations and armies to stand against Hitler's final solution. Once world government is in place, no one will be able to stop the New World Order's plans global population reduction. For those immune to psychological programming, hundreds of FEMA camps have already been built throughout the United States. 
in their quest for population reduction, no method is off the table. These dark builders intend to release a string of man-made bioweapons plagues, each one worse than the last, while at the same time expanding the police state to enforce an orderly extermination of the population, all in the name of fighting invisible terrorists. And the Georgia Guidestones stand today as a cold testament to the elite's sacred mission. To have a two-class system where the underclass are forced to live as slaves in tiny enclosed cities, while the elite enjoy the land of the earth, evolve into superhumans with the aid of advanced implantable technologies, live eternal lives, and travel throughout the cosmos. This is the promise given to the inner members of the New World Order and the agenda of the Bilderberg Group. In 2007, Jim Tucker continued his 30-year quest to expose the globalist by traveling to Istanbul, Turkey, the site of Bilderberg, 2007. Jim Tucker, thank you for coming on, my friend. It's always fun. Jim, tell us what you saw today when you were out at the uh, Ritz Hotel. We were at the Ritz-Carlton. It looked like a typical uh, Bilderberg scenario. They had the armed guards all around the place. They had platoons of uh, uh, cops in uh, formation waiting for the disbursement. They also had uh, cops all the way around the building, and they had all those high-tech things where every member can uh, hear whatever spoken in any language instantly translate into his own language so they can uh, keep up with it. Let's just ask him directly. Okay. Is Bilderberg meeting here this weekend? You can go this way. We had my two personal cops following me today. I was not aware of it because my nose is always sticking to a camera and my jaws are always flapping. But the uh, TV crew said, those guys are uh, going to follow you. And their car followed us out to the uh, hotel. Then they identified the two uh, cops in plain clothes, not, not business suits, but sports shirts and so forth. Yeah. That's the car that's been on our ass? Yeah. You want to photograph him? Yeah. You are, aren't you? Well, they're very likely Bilderberg boys. John Elkin, owner of Fiat and a fellow Bilderberger, thought that they could take a stroll off the grounds without being noticed by the commoners. I was thinking about that. This Bilderberg attendee sneered at our camera. This carload of kingpins gave the media a murderous look and seemed shocked that they would dare point a camera in their direction. Yeah. 
In 2007, the Bilderberg Group received the heaviest global coverage in its history. Jim Tucker witnessed press conferences attended by hundreds of members of the media and a new generation of info warriors, like reporter Paul Dornenu of Romania, are tracking the elite no matter where they hide. Now, Jim, my governor, Rick Perry, it's in the front of the Dallas Morning News. The headline reads, Texas Governor Rick Perry to attend Bilderberg. What does it mean to have the governor of Texas in the Dallas Morning News just admitting he's going to Bilderberg Group? That means he's a potential president, even as the obscure governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, lost his virginity at the Bilderberg meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany in 1991 and he's elected president the following year. Now, if he goes nowhere in a run for the White House in the years ahead, they'll drop him like an old shoe. They do that often. But uh, officially, uh, Bilderberg considers Governor Rick Perry a potential president of the United States. Uh, yes, it's a, a violation of the Logan Act, uh, for which uh, the White, Bill Clinton's White House was fined $300,000 which means the taxpayers paid it. When Perry returned to Texas from Istanbul, we were determined to hold him accountable for his treasonous actions. Tonight, telling you we're not going to put up with it. Long live the Republic! 